Hey guys, hope you're all doing well. Now for today's video, I'm actually joined by a special guest that some of you out there might just know. Go ahead and introduce yourself, man. Hello, my name is Matt. You might know me as Sicko Claw on Twitter. A few of you from a way back might know me at, by that name on Jurassic Park Legacy as well. I have a bachelor's degree in archaeology. I also have a master's degree in geographic information science and technology, which is like the that you can use to map um, sites in archaeology. I'm currently going for my master's degree in archaeology as well. My area of interest is like Mesoamerica, things like the Aztec and the Maya. Right, and today we're here to have a good discussion on paleontology in the Jurassic Park franchise. And when I say paleontology, I don't just mean scientific accuracy as far as the dinosaurs themselves are concerned. We're going to be talking about all of it, what the dinosaurs look like, how the animals behave, and even the men and women of Jurassic Park that represent this branch of science for the audience. So we're going to be talking about a great many things. <laughs> So far, I find it very interesting how the Jurassic Park franchise had depicted paleontologists in general. So far, there have been four main people who have, have studied or been in paleontology in the Jurassic Park films. Alan Grant, we all know, Ellie Sadler, and not Degler, if you the car Degler. Right. <laughs> Uh, Robert Burke and yes, Billy Brennan. He counts because he's a graduate student. And for my purpose of my talk, I kind of separate Alan Grant um, in Jurassic Park Three and Jurassic Park, just because his view seems a lot different. Yeah, they're very different from each other. I think he even says that he liked dinosaur. Or no, Eric Kirby says that he used to like dinosaurs, and Grant says that was before that they tried to eat him in the third uh, in the third movie. So. In your opinion, what would you say the treatment of paleontology has been like in the movies so far? Uh, do you think that the characters in the films accurately represent what you know to be the real deal? Or is there possibly some room for improvement from some of these guys? I have to say that when Jurassic Park originally came out, or when it was written, they were both basing on the paleontology that was available at that time. Mm -hmm. So it's not fair to go back like 25 years later and say, it's not accurate when it's these are findings that were only just starting to be made and didn't really get fully realized until later. Yeah, you can only judge it for the time in which it came out. You know, going back and criticizing it for something that it couldn't possibly have... If no, we didn't know a lot of the stuff we know now back then, so I get what you're saying. It's kind of an unfair judgment. Definitely, and for what it's worth with the paleontology thing, they're actually kind of revolutionary in the first movie. Because when you first see Alan Grant in the dig, he seems to have a fairly large amount of people at a dig. Um, a lot of graduate students around helping him. And then, obviously, we all know that he's excavating the Velociraptor in the Badlands in Montana. Mm -hmm. And they're being very careful with the animal and making sure that it's excavated without damaging it. That's why when you see them, they're, brush they're being careful to brush it off and making sure that they don't damage the bones. I don't... I'm not too sure if we saw that in a movie before Jurassic Park. Paleontology in general wasn't really something that was talked about in dinosaur movies outside of like a Van Helsing type guy that just happened to know everything. He's like, oh, it's a brontosaurus and it's going to crush your car. But then like uh, Jurassic Park actually showed people excavating bones, which was very, uh, yeah, I, it's kind of rare in Hollywood before Jurassic Park anyways. It, it was very rare in Hollywood to see them really just talking about it. And even more, to see them like actually at a paleontology dig. What I like about it is that they take very a lot of care with the specimen. When the helicopter comes, the first thing Grant does is order everybody to cover it with a tarp so the specimen won't get damaged by the sediment flying everywhere. Would you say that that was a little bit of added realism that kind of went a long way in terms of how the general public understands paleontology? I would say so it definitely helps that um, after we see the dinosaurs go roar and everything, is <laughs> that we switch to, okay, these are the dinosaurs. This is somebody who studied dinosaurs. This is his expertise. Mm, right. What I find also, you mentioned about the tools they're using. What a lot of people don't realize is that um, for, for that era, 
branch was actually using all the technology he had available to get the image of the Raptor on the computer, the machine that they used in the form of ground penetrating radar. Yeah, the one with so the uh, the shotgun. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. That, so that was actually a piece of real equipment that was used? They use it today in archaeology and paleontology. A lot of the times you can use this device to tell how far deep something under the surface is. And if something is really close to the surface, you can kind of get like an image of the item underneath without Sweet. having to excavate too or damage it. That's kind of fascinating that they were able to do that, especially in 1993. The technology has advanced a lot, uh, especially, not to get off topic, but especially in archaeology today, you can use actually satellites, use that radar stuff, and you can see where pyramids have been over, that have been overgrown by the jungle in Mexico are. Oh, no way. That's crazy. That's really interesting. Yeah. So um, it's like really a good way for people to find out what's there without having to dig. One thing I do like about Grant, and then, then most people tend to gloss over, is that he seems to be very into trying to educate the public. You know that there's a lot of civilians around the dig, um, kids even. Clearly, he this wasn't a dig that he was being like, oh, there are the only scientists allowed. Um, he was allowing the general public to come in and see what he was doing. Right, yeah. They were actually there to be educated on his expertise, which is one of the reasons why I've always loved that part where he puts that little kid in his place by telling him not to talk trash about the, quote, six-foot turkeys. <laughs> That's true. Um, I think he's kind of like talking to the general public in a way, especially back then in 1993, when he's talking about how the dinosaurs evolved into birds. And he's being very scientific about this. He's pointing out the half moon shaped bones in the wrists or they could later evolve into wings. Right. Another thing I find interesting about the way he talks, they mentioned that the, the, the pubic bone is turned backward just like a bird and then even the name raptor means bird of prey and I think that really helps demonstrate it to the people so that it characterize between a popular dinosaur and a concept they trying to convey. Right, so it's, it's important to point out those sort of things to an audience that may only know of dinosaurs from what they saw in storybooks pre-Jurassic Park. So not as accurate as actually being on the dig site and being told, no, 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 uh, these are what eventually became birds. Uh, so all of that stuff that we get from Grant early on you think is pretty top-notch. Exactly. Um, so when he hears the kid going like, the feathered dinosaur wouldn't be scary, he kind of had the way to confront him with knowledge about what fossils of the time had shown that Velociraptor almost had been found together, indicating the theory that he was a pack hunter. Obviously, I, I can't say that his theory about dinosaur behavior the way that um, raptors would have realistically attacked is accurate. It's more speculation than anything. Mm -hmm. There's only so much Bone can tell you about. Right, yeah. And that's one of the things with the whole behavior thing as far as velociraptors go in the movies where he's explaining like uh, their high intelligence and their, uh, you know, you stare at him, he just stares right back. Even the uh, Tyrannosaur uh, visual acuity being based on movement, which is uh, something that's actually left over from the book, which I think people should know about. But their, their explanation in the book, the reason the T-Rex won't see you is because it has the amphibian DNA. So uh, that's a little bit of the behavior stuff that is uh, different from Jurassic Park in reality. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If you want to get onto the T-Rex vision based on movement, um, they actually did studies and found out that um, the T-Rex as a predator had to rely on its eyesight and their binocular range, which means how, how wide they could see around them, is actually wider than a hawk's. Oh, wow. Um, the wider an animal's range, the better its depth perception and capacity to distinguish between something moving and non-moving. And the, the reason we have to is because the, a lot of the time the prey animals, their first instinct is to free up before are running away. Oh, nice. Yeah, I wanted to go further, a little bit further, with the Grant and Jurassic. Um, can we start hearing about, obviously, something that's very important with paleontology is the need for funding. 
and I found it very interesting that obviously with Hammond he can't back down because Hammond's the one funding his thing for fifty thousand a season, mm -hmm. and like okay I'll pay for the rest of the season, and they're like okay for the next three years, and that's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So where the he was thinking to himself, I'm never going to get another donor like this, and which is probably kind of realistic sometimes. And another thing I wanted to say is that Grant, they seem to be doing a bit of scientific work there in the in the trailer as well. They have like a microscope on the table. Oh yeah, yeah, they've got all kinds of stuff in their trailer. Uh, a lot of little Easter egg things too, I think, with the old Bone Wars from like the 1800s. I think that's a newspaper clipping in the background so a little bit of a history well i guess you'd have to know what that means before you see it but i guess that goes a long way too i, I want to say later on a lot about um biology and at least the basic fundamentals of cloning the speech from hammond about how they clone the dinosaurs he asked how do they interrupt the cellular mitosis mm -hmm. which is not something that most people in 1993 would have the general public in 1993 would have known about, especially since cloning is a pretty involved process. Yeah, well, yeah, totally. I, I actually forgot what that cellular mitosis was until I was in college and I had a biology class. And I was like, oh, so they were telling the truth <laughs> in Jurassic Park. That attention to detail, I guess, is extremely important, at least in convincing uh, the general audience who doesn't know something like that and someone who does. Yeah. So, um, if we get back to the birth scene when Tim confronts Grant, read his book and questions about how the birth evolved the dinosaurs. Yeah. And Grant just kind of like not engaging him at all. I read your book, and Grant's like, uh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, he educates the kid, but I think that would be because he was annoyed with the kid here. He kind of realizing that the kid's going to follow me around if I answer him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like putting him off. I think he also tells him uh, that Backer's book was bigger. So he's like comparing him to a real life paleontologist too, saying that that guy was better than Grant. When I was doing that research, I actually realized that the, it's the exact point where Tim brings up Backer that Grant just slammed the door on him. Oh, really? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Do you think that could be like a, a Jack Horner uh, sort of uh, rival thing with uh, Robert Backer? To where like they forced Grant to just shut the door as soon as he mentioned his name? It could be possible. You get, I, I'll get into it when we talk about Burke. Right, right. It could be possible. Um, and I also wanted to, to seg you into talking about Ellie. But even though she doesn't talk about it at the Munch at the Grant, there are some stuff that she talks about and paleontologically. Right. And... For those of you that don't know, she is not a paleontologist, she is a paleobotanist. But she's still working with Grant at the dig site. She's still working very closely with him, actually. Um, so Ellie Sattler, would you say that she is an accurate representation of what her job would entail in the real life? Yeah, I, I find it interesting, even if she was a paleobotanist, she still does know some detail about paleontology. Um, when she's talking about the raptor skeleton on the computer monitor, he noticed that it has post-mortem contraction on the neck bones in the raptor. Basically, we all know the seeing that picture and some Jurassic Park and the raptor skeleton with its neck arched way back. Mm -hmm. um, basically, this is typical of most fossils, um, the death poles. Right. People used to think that was because the dinosaur died in agony. I think they covered this in the novel a bit too and that the neck arching back was because of the death drove of the dinosaur. However, others in the paleontology community uh, speculated maybe because water currents randomly arranged it that way during fossilization to, to force the neck back. And still others say that it's the cause of the neck bone contracting into like bigger mortis and stuff after death. Right, and is that something that you actually, I know, I know it's very rare to find a skeleton anywhere near as complete what they showed in, in Jurassic Park, at least in that condition. But is that a normal pose that you would find in most theropod dinosaurs? Yeah, it's definitely. When you find the barrel case, when you do find um, complete skeletons, especially like dinosaurs, sometimes you find them with back like that. And it's been enough time for people that made that theory. But I wanted to get onto this um, topic with 
watching it. And I think you may have covered before in your Jurassic Park deleted scenes, right? When she's in the Jeep, in the Brachiosaurus scene, she's holding the, a leaf, but we never see her grab the leaf. Yeah, I've mentioned it briefly. That I believe where she grabs the leaf was in the Jurassic Park trailer, but we never see it in the final movie. Um, so she says, this species, the Veriformin, has been extinct since the Cretaceous period. So that's the first indication that an Indian is, of course, cloning plants as well as animals. Although, something very interesting to me is that Indian is cloning plants, just putting them like along the, the side of your main entrance to the park. Not really like flashy or trying to show it off, just like background. Yeah, that's interesting. It's so close that you could actually just reach out of your Jeep and grab it then. So uh, that's got to be a little expensive for the company to clone this extinct plant that someone that's could just rip up. <laughs> Um, so, from what, um, they gave it a similar name to the novel in Veriformin. However, the plant in question, because the Veriformin is supposed to be a fictional species of fern, however, what she's holding is clearly a leaf from a flowering plant. Right, so there wasn't really too much effort on that part to change anything, but it was said to be, uh, an extinct plant. Yeah, and, and what I found out in my research is that that Latin name referred to something that's worm-like and clearly see in the um, dinner scene, which he's holding not worm-like at all. <laughs> right. And then she points out later in the dinner scene that you can't really know about extinct um, ecosystems. You got plants here that are poisonous. However, it is unclear if she's referring to the leaf that she was holding earlier. Can I figure to myself, she wouldn't be touching it if it was poison. Yeah, that would be kind of counterproductive on her half and not exactly that smart. So maybe she saw some other sort of extinct plants that were poisonous that we didn't see on screen? That's possible. Definitely um, very possible for her to have seen something else since we're not shown their travel back from the Brachiosaurus thing. And now I want to get on to Richard and Levine. Since after this, um, Ellie doesn't really talk paleontology. All right, Robert Burke, he is based on the novel character. He's kind of an obligation of George Bathleton and Richard Levine from The Lost World. And that he's a know-it-all who likes to think that he knows everything, but he really doesn't. Yeah, he's, he's pretty wrong, particularly on uh, T-Rex, as Sarah Harding points out. Also, I'm sure you've covered this in your previous talks, but he's especially about the the oh, to Lost World script. You might know what character he's based on. Well, in real life, yeah, the uh, uh, paleontologist Robert Backer. Now, there actually yeah. there is another paleontologist in the Lost World script named Doctor Judson. He was like the gatherer version of Burke. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And uh, if I remember correctly, Dr. Judson was supposed to get killed by velociraptors uh, during their escape, like when the helicopter comes, correct? Yes, uh, maybe they thought in the film that the loss of Eddie was enough of a loss for the gatherers, that only the bad guys should be punished. Yeah, well, it's a criticism that some people throw at Jurassic Park, that uh, they shouldn't kill any good guys. I don't agree with it, but... Um, yeah, I, I see where you, that makes a lot of sense. I know that they kind of... I think they kind of merged Dr. Judson with Sarah Harding because they gave her some of his dialogue from that script. Like where, because you know in the script, Dr. Judson and Dr. Burke are arguing back and forth about their paleontological theories. And, yeah. uh, you know, Sarah Harding does that briefly where she's like, no, don't bet on it to Dr. Uh, Burke when they're at the uh, hunter's camp after the trailers go over the cliff. Right, um, so I wanted to say, back to when you said about Backer, I did some more research. He's a very clear homage to Robert Backer. Backer was the guy who kind of said that T-Rex is a predator, where Jack Horner was like, no, T-Rex is a scavenger. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so Burke was written by Spielberg, and then he made him get eaten by the T-Rex as a favor for Horner. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things that a lot of people have uh, caught on to. And I, I, you know, another thing, uh, Jack Horner's the guy that eventually would make the Spinosaurus uh, kill the T-Rex after they depict the, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it was all up to him, but they depict the T-Rex only eating something dead in Jurassic Park 3. So there's a little bit of that, that scavenger theory going on there, too. However, um, what I found out, my research backer had a sense of humor about this, and he liked the character, and so he sent Horner a little message saying, 
Hey, I was right. T Rex was a hunter after all. <laughs> yeah, after he'd been eaten in the movie. That's great. <laughs> Uh, what do you personally think about Dr. Burke as a paleontologist? Would you think that he's an accurate representation of not necessarily Backer, but any paleontologist? Has you ever run into somebody like that before? Well, he clearly thinks he knows a lot when he doesn't. He was hired by Luzzo for the extraction team, which makes me think that in the universe, he was like well-known, at least on the pop of their circuit. So Luzzo went and said, mm, let's get the first paleontologist I can find who will accept my offer. <laughs> you know, and that's right, and that goes back to what you were saying earlier, where he's kind of like George Basselton from the novel, because that's the guy that Dodson gets to go to Isla Sorna. First you see him, interestingly enough, he's making observations about all these different animals. Right. When we first see him, he does identify the Paki as a herbivore from the late Cretaceous. He details how the dome was used for absorbing impacts. Um, this is actually a common hypothesis in the paleontology community. That the dome was used for headbutting the other males. Um, paleontological evidence supports this. This have been studies showing actually damage to the domes of their skulls in multiple specimens, which would support a hypothesis for them using their domes to hit each other with. Hmm, interesting. However, what I was gonna say about him knowing less than he thinks, what I think is the most famous example of this, he misidentified the compies. Yeah, that's right. He says uh, Compsognathus triassicus. Yeah, and it's just Compsognathus. And pro Compsognathus is not in the movie. So only that's in an, the novel. Yeah, only in the novel. So he got that wrong, too. <laughs> he's, he's not exactly that great of a paleontologist, is he? Oh, uh, and on top of that, I checked. Neither specimen is known in the paleontological record have been a scavenger. They mainly thought to have eaten small mammals, insects, and lizards. Right, so he's wrong on everything as far as the combies go. <laughs> he must yeah. be like the bargain bin paleontologist that they got. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe he has, though, has, has a bit of those ham and jeans, so he's like, spare no expense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, spare no expense, air quotes. <laughs> have you said before, he wrongly believed T-Rex would only pursue in, their, in the given territory. Right. He said that they were a rogue and that they wouldn't care about their infants, I believe, right? Yeah, and he's like granting away, he's making a lot of assumptions about a dinosaur behavior that he can't prove at all based on bones. Yeah, only he is pretty wrong, whereas Grant was proved right in the first film, as far as the vision goes, which is, again, something from the book. But uh, as we learn in The Lost World, the T-Rex will pursue them even after they leave their territory. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that when you first see them, T-Rex is in the train there. I know it's a bit off topic, but like, what's the first thing that Malcolm, Sarah, and Nick Van Owen do when they see the first T-Rex peer? Oh yeah, they, they do all remain pretty still. That way they won't be seen. Exactly. Um, I wanted to move on to Billy. We first see him in Grand Stig in Montana. Uh, he advises the fellow grad student to use the toothbrush to brush fine sediment off of almost excavated raptor instead of a larger one, which is correct, because you want to make sure that you're very precise with your work. He explains fossilization to her, saying that the calcium in the bones was replaced by fossilization. He claimed to be able to show her the difference that the rock was rough and the bone was smooth. But, of course, um, not as smooth as he thinks. <laughs> it's not as easy as he's making it out to be in the film. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, he's making it to be a little bit more simpler, and he showed a little bit of... I know they're both grad students, but he showed a little bit of trying to flirt rather than pay attention to what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, so he could injure the bones or something while he's messing around. <laughs> not the smartest thing to do. What I find interesting is that it seems to me that Billy is the one that's really into the 3D printing, uh, the Velociraptor resonating chamber. He viewed it um, the future so yeah. that to be able to create replicas of fossils. And that's also what they kind of do sometimes. Modern day fossil um, museums of a fossil is too difficult to display. In a medium context, you can create like a copy of it. Right. So that is some. That's how they build those bones and put them in museums. Most of them are three D printed. That's interesting. Or put like, or like cast. Yes. Well, yeah, cast. That would make sense too. 
So it's kind of interesting. Jurassic Park 3's technology, as far as the uh, you know 3D printing goes of fossils, could be applicable to real day museums. That's quite interesting. That's one scene in the film that I've I've often kind of struggled with paying attention to because he uh, he does it and he takes it out and he perfectly blows and it, it it sounds enough like a velociraptor. Now, could that happen in real life? I I, I don't think it could, but uh, you would know better than me. I remember that as well, too. Papa Billy um, says he was quizzed by Grant on what the spina was, right? Yeah. And Billy said, oh, such a mime is because of the snout. No, that's wrong. Told no, that's wrong by Alan. And he said, oh, Baryonyx. Um, he said, no, because of the sail. He tells him to think bigger. And when he says Baryonyx, I was like, well, that's that's smaller than Sukumimus, Billy. What the heck? Ironically, Baryonyx would later be cloned by engines. Yeah, and seen in Fallen Kingdom way later. Would you say Billy... As a grad student uh, and his relationship with Grant and everything, would you say that he's uh, a decent addition to the franchise as far as uh, paleontologist goes? I would say he clearly is taking advantage of doing the um, paleontology as well as he can because you gotta think of it this way Grant, a superstar in paleontology after Jurassic Park, right? Yeah, with him, has to do big things for his career. I can't imagine that those internships would, would be needed to get. That's true. So uh, Billy might be uh, treating Grant like uh, he's some kind of rock star, especially yeah, uh, since he knows what he's been through in the you know on Isla Nublar. And speaking of Grant, I wanted to say that when he was at the <clears throat> Degler house, I can't even say it. No. <laughs> <laughs> working on Raptor, he sort of tried to back up his experience on Raptor intelligence with his experience at Jurassic Park, and which I find this very interesting. I think that it's planned to use the Raptor skull resonating chamber to prove his theories, and he believed that this was their key to vocalize and coordinate their attacks. He thought this actually meant that they were smarter than primates. However, what I find very interesting is that five minutes later in his speech to the college, he actually brings fossil specimens of the raptor bones, including the killing claws, to show on display during his speech. Right. And he goes on to say they could have been the predominant species on the planet due to this. He seems to be basing this again on an experience in Jurassic Park. And I find it very interesting when he's talking, he's basically going begging for funds when he talked to Ellie earlier he says she called him the last of his breed or he called himself the last of his breed yeah that's really interesting if they needed more support at college due to how much um, paleontology seems to be dropping off in interest one thing I find interesting is that no one in the audience had a question about paleontology that didn't relate to Jurassic Park yeah or uh, or the San Diego incident which he did not witness <laughs> person to ask him about his work, ask him, excuse me, Mr. Grant, isn't this all obsolete academic? Can't we just go to the islands and observe them? And he said, no, these are genetically engineered theme park monsters that are scientifically worthless for paleontologists to go and study, whereas we're supposed to just forget that five minutes earlier he was telling Ellie all about the theories about raptor intelligence and the whole vocalization thing was actually based on his experience at Jurassic Park. Right, so he's basically, he's trying to tell people, no, Jurassic Park's bad, they're not real dinosaurs, but all of his research is going into his experience from Jurassic Park, and that's that's all that he has backing it up, so he's kind of, uh, yeah, I, get, I, I see exactly what you're getting at, it's kind of contradictory. It might not entirely be, he could be trying to dig away people from going because he doesn't want people to come in barging on his um, on his products and taking over papers that he himself had probably planned to write. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good point, too. Maybe it's a little bit of a warning, like, hey, you don't want to go there. I went there. I almost got eaten. Didn't you read my second book? Maybe... Well, based on my experiences. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Grant and Billy in Jurassic Park 3, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, I did notice in uh, Jurassic Park Three that and when he you can see that for the first time Liam he's affiliated with on the um, on the truck that he gets out of when he got the big site it said Liam of the Rockies yeah and it's got an Allosaurus skull on it doesn't it 
Yes. So he's being funded through a museum. However, unlike Jurassic Park, he seems to have, have a hard time getting funding since the interest in paleontology is drying up. Yeah, and, and this is important too. I, I Just very briefly, I wanted to touch on the fact that in JP3, we see that interest in paleontology is dying uh, because of the fact that there are real dinosaurs on Isla Sorna and, uh, you know, Isla Nublar later on, we'd learn. So we haven't seen any paleontologists in Jurassic World or Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Now, there are a lot of rumors that Alan Grant will be coming back to the next movie, and we know for a fact Laura Dern's going to be in it. Do you think that maybe the new characters are going to need a paleontologist in order to progress the story forward? Because as we saw in JP3, um, the focus of the general public had moved away from the bones and onto the clones, so to speak. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. That sounded kind of dumb, but <laughs> that's the truth. Um, do you think that the implementation of paleontologists like Alan Grant could really help Jurassic World 3 as far as connecting everything together. Um, back to JP3 too, which, like you said, interest was drying up. I definitely think it could help. Like, um, obviously, now that you have dinosaurs on the mainland, the uh, government would definitely be hiring its own to be able to how best those creatures are to be managed. And among those people would probably be lots of paleontologists. Like, again, Grant and paleontologists might run the forefront since you kind of got people asking all these sorts of questions. What were those animals like? How do we deal with them now? Um, how do we manage them? So it's going to be a little more... Uh, they kind of need him a little more than they thought they did back in the uh, 2001 Jurassic Park 3 days. I, I can I see where you're coming from where it's like yeah we need you uh, we need paleontologists to help us with this new world exactly okay so I ask I also wanted to ask uh, now you're as big of a fan of this franchise as I am and since you do what you do I wanted to ask this question for you specifically uh, what would you th say is the most accurate looking and behaving dinosaur as far as we know in the entire Jurassic Park franchise that one, I think, is a tough one. Obviously, for every actor in one, you get the Dilophosaurus with the frills. Right, of course. And of course, and we all know Velociraptor look nothing. The real Velociraptor was like chicken size. Mongoliensis, yeah. Yes. For for paleontologically accurate, you can probably discount almost all the theropods as being paleontologically accurate since they're all more than scaleless without feathers. Right, okay. Probably with herbivores, perhaps the sauropods, probably be your best bet for paleontology or, or another herbivore like the ankylosaurus. Right, so in that case, you would mean animals like the brachiosaurus, apatosaurus, or uh, even mamenchisaurus from the Lost World being probably the more uh, faithful recreations. Yes. And again, uh, I mean, we shouldn't have to mention this, but they're, uh, they're genetically engineered clones with frog DNA, but, um, uh, you know, some people are going to bring that up on how they're all monsters when I don't think they're monsters, but, uh, they do indeed have different DNA in their blood. Yes, they all have the different DNA and modified to some extent. I, I, I want to say, obviously, once you get further away from the, the main clones to like their offspring, you have the gene pool maybe dilute a little bit, perhaps. Ooh, could that explain the Jurassic Park 3 uh, quilled or bird-like raptors? There have been like a lot of people trying to explain. I have researched a lot of stuff in, in regards to like the Jurassic Park thing over the years. And one thing I have noticed, especially since um, in my free time, I help contribute to a a fan-based Jurassic Park encyclopedia called Jurassicpedia. Based on the old Jurassic Park legacy encyclopedia. Maybe you remember reading that back in the day? Oh yeah, oh I was on Jurassic Park Legacy all the time, man. Um, I missed that banner with the red, uh, you know what I'm talking about, with the T-Rex and the Spinosaurus and 
the uh, the trees and everything. I was on that website a lot. Those were the days I was Googling Jurassic Park 4 in the news, trying as hard as I could to find something. And those were the days. <laughs> so what we decided when we, back in the old Jurassic Park Legacy Encyclopedia was that we decided, okay, we're just for our, our own sake, we're going to call these animals virgins because um, the raptors in Telos World looks like an upgrade from the Jurassic Park. But then the ones in Telos World look very different. Uh, and Jurassic Park 3 look very different than Telos World or Jurassic Park. Right. And the whole version thing actually makes a lot of sense because it comes from the book, too, where Henry Wu talks about the... Uh, well, we kind of saw that in Jurassic World where he talked about making the dinosaurs however he wanted to. Uh, the chapter is version 4.4 in the novel. It can make a little bit more sense to um, the Jurassic Park 3 raptors were in the south of the island and the, um, the tiger stripe to Lost World raptor in the north of the island. Yeah, a bit of a different ecological background. It would also explain the uh, the plant life being quite different. You go from Redfoot, uh, Redwoods in the Lost World to Hawaii in JP3. So yeah. different sections of the island does make a lot of sense. Now, as far as the animals are concerned, what can you tell us about the behavior of some specific species? I know you said it was kind of hard to say anything concrete because we could only get so much from bones. And we already talked about the raptors and that they weren't really that smart in real life. But uh, is there any sort of behavioral techniques that we see in the films that you would say is possible for the real life animals? One thing I always say when behavior, talking about like a specific animal behavior, what I'd like to talk about is the the T Rexes in um, the Lost World. There's something that's kind of echoing from the novel in the in the film regarding the T Rex behaviors. The thing that's coming to my mind generally is the protection of their infants. Yes, Sam, and also when you found the baby there, it the, their perceived territory would change to that cliff area. The defense of the hatchlings or the offspring of the tyrannosaurs is something that could very well have been the case in real life. It's very difficult to tell, but um, because the T-Rexes were shown as a mating pair, because which is um, in a lot of animals, the male and the female do not stick around for life, or the or the male sometimes in some species can scoot out the way immediately after the female lays her eggs. I do know that for birds, like, uh, there's some Canadian geese that fly down to where I am sometimes, and I know that they mate for life. Now, T-Rex is not a goose, but since they are birds, so to speak, the mated pair always seemed to something that was uh, taken from the real world in our modern-day context and applied to the ancient dinosaurs. Uh, I wanted to just include this quote from um, Tilatuo here. Welcome to eat the sauna where the geese chase you. Right. <laughs> So uh, the T-Rex behavior in the Lost World. It's funny that uh, that's the one that you said uh, that you wanted to talk about because I've always thought that the Lost World Jurassic Park, for all it is, is probably, and this is just in my opinion, I always took it that that was the most paleontological movie out of all of them because they go into the T-Rex's behavior and we talk about their uh, Burke has his theories that are obviously wrong that Sarah has to correct him on. We actually see the behavior play out, not only on the island, but when they get off of the island, when uh, the T-Rexes are in San Diego. You know, later on we see uh, hunting behavior with the uh, velociraptors in the long grass. I could be wrong, but uh, I always, Lost World always struck me as the most paleontological out of the first three. I know a lot of people probably say the first movie. Uh, what do you personally think? I think that um, the Lost World is the one, it's like, Definitely a movie where the animals feel like animals and not monsters. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's, yeah, that, I couldn't have said it better. That's that's one of those things that I, I, I think the Lost World captured that more so than any of them. You have the Spinosaurus stalking them halfway across the island like a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> Jason <laughs> Voorhees of dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. All right, man, so that was a pretty good chat. So we talked a lot about the different dinosaur behaviors that are actually accurate in the films and what aren't. Obviously, Raptor came at the top. But uh, it was really cool to talk about the different paleontologists like Billy, Alan, paleobotanist Ellie, and especially uh, 
I, I enjoyed talking about Burke quite a bit and his relationship with uh, Robert Backer. I just want to say thanks for uh, coming on. It's really cool to talk about this because I don't feel like fans get to discuss paleontology in Jurassic Park honestly or really even that often without it turning into like a crazy, oh, raptors have feathers, you know, you know some sort of argument back and forth. So again, I want to say thank you for uh, coming on the channel. It really means a lot. You're welcome. I, I'm glad to be able to come here and talk. I've been a big fan of the, your videos. How thorough they are. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, we'll have to do some sort of meetup sometime. That way we could get a lot of people together. Similar to like the JP25 event. I think it'd be cool to get a lot of us out there talking with each other. Actually, um, I, I think the, the last time there was a really big meetup of Jurassic fans was that um, event during the 25th, like you said. And I think that's the one thing that really brought people together, and it'd be really cool if there could be something else like that. One thing I proposed probably that's big enough probably to bring people from all over the world together, again like that, is if Universal did something big for the Jurassic Park ride opening. I hope they do, and I, I've thought the same thing you did, because like you said, that 25th anniversary was really cool to see so many fans get together. Uh, a lot of the people from Outpost were there. Uh, you were there. Matt Brando was there. Uh, Greg Wong, I was with him. We watched Jurassic Park with Colin Trevorrow. I shook his hand. <laughs> we. I think that the fan base needs more of that, but hey, that's just me. Definitely they need um, more games together. We're so far. You can feel so spread apart sometimes. Yeah, we could definitely use some more of those uh, events. Don't just give them all to Star Wars. Jurassic Park makes a lot of money, too. Fallen Kingdom made over a billion, well over a billion. Um, <laughs> yeah, we uh, we definitely need more. All right, and uh, with that being said, where can they find you on social media, man? You can find me on my Twitter account, SickleClaw. Instagram's the same, too, right? Yeah, pretty much. Sweet. All right, man. Again, thanks for coming on. Welcome. Glad to help. Now before I go, I'd like to thank all of my game wardens, as well as all of my engine executives. I'd also like to thank all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. Guys, it seriously means the world to me that you've all continued to support me the way you do, and I never want you to ever forget that. Now I'd like to thank all of you for watching today's video, and hope you all enjoyed the content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like, and hope that you'll consider subscribing if you're interested in hearing from me again. I'll see you all in the next one, guys, and as always, take it easy.